This morning, we're going to hear from three speakers, again, focusing on the, path, on the um, aspects of pathways of exposure. And for those of you on the board, their biosketches are provided in your briefing materials. Each speaker has about 20 minutes for his presentation. After that, we'll have a few minutes for clarifying questions. So we'll open it on the floor only briefly and please direct your questions to the speaker for clarification only. At the end of all three presentations, we do have time for a larger discussion. As a panel discussion, uh, the board will have priority in uh, asking questions and having that discussion but I will reserve a little bit of time at the end to make sure that we do have time for any questions, discussion, or input from our visitors or people that are on uh, the phone and also on the live stream. So again, please be aware that this session is being recorded and it is being streamed live over the internet. For those of you who are on the webcast, please note that you will be on mute. And if you do have a question that you would like to rise for discussion, there is a chat function that you can see on your screen on the webcast. Please use that to submit your questions for discussion. So with that, I'll introduce our first speaker. Uh, this is Jeff Plumley. He's with the USGS as the Associate Director for Environmental Health and Acting Associate Director for Energy and Mineral Resources. But he assures us that that has um, been his position for only the last few years. And prior to that, he's been a very dedicated scientist and has created a, a lot of uh, information in the area of uh, subsurface contaminants. His presentation is Transdisciplinary Science to Understand Natural Subsurface Contaminants and Their Health Implications. Jeff? Great. Well, thanks very much. Everybody can hear me, I, I hope. So um, I thought that I would give a look, seeing the, the mix of talks that are being presented in these, in these series of seminars, I thought I would take a little bit different tack that actually fits very nicely in with my, my science career um, up until a couple of years ago. And that's working across disciplines, uh, transdisciplinary work. And we'll talk about natural contaminants in the subsurface. So natural and contaminant, people argue that might be somewhat of an oxymoron. How can it be a contaminant if it's natural? But it, it's a substance that basically can still have a health effect. And uh, just a quick background for those of you that may not know the USGS. The USGS is a natural science agency within Interior Department. We're non-regulatory. Uh, we're truly interdisciplinary. We have biologists, geologists, hydrologists, geochemists, microbiologists, remote sensors, folks like that. And it gives us a unique power to look at source, transport, fate, exposure pathways, biological effects like toxicity and other health effects, and then working with public health people in other agencies and, and other organizations, what are the implications for, for human health? And these two uh, mission areas that I'm uh, involved with actually Environmental health mission area is what I would, would call the water and biology component and uh, energy and mineral resources, which is where I spent most of my career looking at mining environmental issues or mining and health issues. Uh, that's more the geology component and it's more or less the geology component with some water that I'm going to be talking about today. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about exposure pathways for natural contaminants and then give some science examples uh, from uh, folks at the USGS colleagues and also from my career, uh, just because that's what I know the best. And then if I have time, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about a slightly different topic that we, we find very interesting and compelling at the USGS and looking at uh, pathogens shed from their animal hosts into the environment as contaminants. So exposure pathways, um, basically, uh, over on the left is a big unmined mineralized area in southwestern Colorado, but you can see the mines have come in and selectively put on underground workings. All that material in these mineralized rocks can contain high levels of copper, zinc, which are, can be toxic to fish, and arsenic and lead and other things. And basically natural weathering can produce um, degraded environmental conditions, uh, natural acid rock drainage. Um, but then humans, when they, when they act on it, they actually accelerate the exposures and the weathering processes. 
So um, weathering is one key way that uh, contaminants can get from the subsurface into the environment uh, that produces soils, which can then be ingested by hand to mouth pathways or can become windblown dust and inhaled. Uh, erosion, sediment transport, this is a debris flow from the Colorado floods um, in 2013. That can expose a lot of material that then can become windblown. Uh, leaching of contaminants, uh, groundwater is reacting with, with sulfide mineralization, can come out, they can then dry up. This is a tailings dam, I don't know if you can see, but it's it's uh, yellow windblown dust that are full of evaporative acid salts that have very high levels of cadmium and zinc. And then uh, human activities can also expose geological materials at the surface. And, and even uh, the near surface, desert crust, help protect the, uh, the soil underneath. And when human activities break those apart, uh, that can actually lead to dust generation, uh, things like landslides, and then human construction activities as well. So I, I think everybody knows a lot about arsenic and groundwater uh, and its natural or geogenic source. Um, it first came to light in Bangladesh and there's been a lot of work done on it. Uh, basically uh, attempts to move to, um, to a non-polluted groundwater source from contaminated surface waters. They ended up tapping into arsenic rich aquifers and uh, led to arsenic-related uh, uh, health problems for, for many people. Um, and they think millions are exposed, and I, I haven't seen any updated numbers on how many people actually have health effects. But you can see the EPA drinking water standard, 10 ppb, and uh, essentially everything other than the blue dots is greater than that. And so they can lead to hyperkeratosis of skin, skin lesions, cancers, diabetes, um, and bladder cancer. So this is from my colleague, George Bright at USGS, who worked on the problem, one of many. Basically, it's an interesting geological problem. Arsenic starts out life in the Himalayas as um, arsenic and pyrite or silicates. Um, there's some thermal spring waters that gets oxidized as erosion is happening, transforms to arsenic-5, absorbed uh, to iron oxide. Uh, that gets carried downstream as sediments. Uh, but that when they get deposited out of contact with the oxygen, uh, plant debris causes reduction with ferrous iron and arsenic-3 in the water. If you go far enough out, actually the bacterial sulfate reduction in areas where seawater is impinging can actually reform the, the arsenic-rich pyrite. So that's a, it's part of a geological cycle that, the, that basically the, the tube wells that were installed tapped into. Uh, this is a photo taken by George and you can actually see the reducing conditions in, in uh, I'm not sure exactly where this is in Bangladesh, but here in the, in the orange, those are iron oxide rich sediments with arsenic sorbed, it's relatively immobile, uh, but down in the organic rich sediments with elevated mobile arsenic up to as much as 2000 ppb. And basically the tube wells came down and tapped that. Uh, colleagues at, um, in our New Hampshire Water Science Center and in Reston, have been looking at geogenic arsenic in groundwaters and private well waters in the U.S. And basically, they can uh, the bedrock, dep depending on the geology, can be quite enriched in arsenic. And so they developed this ge geology-based probability map of, map of arsenic in New England bedrock groundwaters. Uh, uh, Joe Ayat also has been working with our National Water Quality Database to uh, look at arsenic to take data on arsenic in well waters and surface waters, and basically uh, generate this probability map of arsenic greater than 10 micrograms per liter. Uh, Joe and colleagues have been working with the National Cancer Institute in, in various parts of the U.S. to actually show how the geologic sourced arsenic going into the water can actually then translate into an increased bladder cancer risk. So this is an example of transdisciplinary science where the earth science, the geologists are working with the hydrologists and the geochemists and the public health people to actually help understand the issue. And now we're also, uh, USGS and, and others are working on how we can make use of our knowledge of geochemistry and hydrology to help reduce exposures to arsenic containing water. And there, there are things that, that can be done with, with well placement and things like that. Uh, moving on to a, a, a different topic, more in the solids. Um, everybody knows about asbestos and the occupational exposures to commercially and industrially uh, used asbestos. 
Uh, arianite is a fibrous zeolite that causes the same sorts of diseases. Um, but in the late, two, in the late 1990s, uh, concerns started increasing about asbestos and arianite that are in the rock, are naturally occurring in the rocks and what happens when those rocks get disturbed and what are the actual exposure and health risks of living in areas where, or working in areas where, for example, natural asbestos or arianite incur in the near surface rocks and soils and are disturbed or where ex excavation may bring them up to the surface. And in the case of, of North Dakota and arianite, they are actually using arianite containing gravels to gravel the roads in uh, the, in the uh, Bakken formation to, uh, to uh, where many trucks per day would drive over and generate these dust clouds. And, and so there's, there's a lot of attention being paid to this uh, and there are a lot of headlines, but the question is, what are the actual risks? And so asbestos and arianite can occur in specific geologic environments. And uh, my colleague, Brad Van Gosen, we had a project back in the early 2000s where we started compiling data. So these are known occurrences of amphibole asbestos, chrysotile asbestos, or arianite. And it only occurs in, in fairly restricted geologic conditions. So if people are worried about natural occurrences uh, of asbestos, then you don't really, or arianite, don't really need to worry in some places. And you can see here, uh, this, for example, in the, in the, sorry, the Western US, uh, ophiolite belts, same in the Eastern US. So the geologists can actually start helping understand where the occurrences are, what's the mineralogy, also, more importantly, what are, what are things like the chemistry, the length to width, and other parameters that might influence the toxicity of the fibers that, they're, uh, that uh, people are, might be inhaling. And this is actually only one part of, uh, there's a lot more that the earth scientists, I'm not going to be talking about, but there's a lot more the earth scientists can be doing to actually work with toxicologists to better understand how these geologic materials, how their chemical composition, physical parameters, things like that, might, and surface chemistry might affect it. So um, going back, so if we have the geologic occurrences, one of the things we can then do is compare with epidemiological databases. Now, the, one of the things that sticks out right away is that uh, this is mag malignant mesothelioma deaths from CDC, but you can see very high levels in all the shipyard cities and, and major urban areas. So it's very clear that occupational exposures produce very high rates. Uh, for, I think that then tends to apply that that environmental exposures or occupational exposures to environmental asbestos and arianite might have a lower rate, a substantial lower rate, which actually is a good thing. Uh, um, one of the areas where this has recently been in, in play is in Clark County, Nevada, where, uh, where Brenda Buck and, and colleagues at University of Nevada, Las Vegas have found a, a new occurrence of new type of asbestos occurrence where it's filling fractures in the granitic rocks, and it's quite, quite abundant. So the question is, if it's there, what are the exposures and how far and what health risks? So we set up some number of years ago this uh, USGS Powell Arianite Working Group with uh, National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, Aubrey Miller. I think a lot of folks here will recognize Aubrey's name. But basically, we got folks from NIEHS, USGS, NIOSH, ATSDR, USDA, and uh, National uh, NRCS, uh, University of Cincinnati. Uh, so this is truly transdisciplinary of uh, geologists working with health scientists. And we are slowly being able to uh, start working on linking our earth science databases with their, uh, with their epidemiology databases. Um, so work still in progress on that. Um, shift over to coccidioides, the soil fungus that causes valley fever. Uh, it's in the hot desert southwest, and uh, it's very expensive. Uh, there was a paper from CDC a, a few years back showing that from 2011, 2000 to 2011, the healthcare costs in California were greater than uh, $2 billion. And the, this is the endemic range in 2010, but they're now seeing occurrences in southeastern Washington, northern California and other places as well. So it's interesting, is the endemic range changing and, and why would that be the case? So this is a naturally occurring soil fungus. Um, it was, I think, first came into prominence in the 94 California Northridge earthquake. USGS seismologist Randy Gibson worked with CDC. And basically these purple spots are landslides in the Santa Susana Mountains. The green are 
um, marine sediments with high, possibly high boron. And these yellow dots are the occurrences of a valley, valley fever outbreak that came within the first couple of weeks after the earthquake. It's basically a fan-shaped distribution of dust coming from these landslides. And there actually was an outbreak in sea otters offshore as well. So um, based on this, there was a lot of speculation that marine rich sails and, and with the chemistry such as boron that might act as microbicide to enhance the, the competitive edge for the soil fungus against other, back, other pathogens. Uh, there was some speculation about that. So the scientists are playing a role working with the health scientists to understand what are the soil characteristics that influence the favorability for growth of, of coccidioides. And colleagues at USGS, uh, uh, Fred Fisher and Mark Boltman have been working on this as well. And it seems like uh, there might be, since we're seeing it now in southeastern Washington, the, the geological characteristics of the soils are not the same as they were in the Northridge. So it seems like we're moving. It's something, a more complex model that we need to be looking at. Uh, one of the things is that soil fungus likes hot temperatures. It can't survive the really hot conditions in the very uppermost part, but it needs to, it, it can outcompete the others a little bit below the surface. So anything that gets down below that upper layer of soil, like human disturbance or erosion during a rainstorm that then takes the, the spores and transports them into sheet wash and, and overbank deposits from which dust exposures can occur, that, that might be something to go on. And, uh, and we're working, we've got a project now with CDC uh, looking at who, basically there are mechanisms now where they can actually test soil samples and see the presence or absence of, of the soil spores. That was a new development fairly recently. So it's that kind of work working together. What's the chemical characteristics? Are there certain elements that are enriched? Can we actually see toxins that might be in the soils that might be indicative of, uh, of the presence and detecting it? Then what can we do to actually help prevent exposures and understand how can we predict soils where it might be, might be present? Um, last one, and I think I've got a couple more minutes left, um, is uh, work that we did with CDC and Doctors Without Borders on an outbreak of lead poisoning in northern Nigeria linked to artisanal gold mining. And this is a case where the subsurface contaminants were down below the surface, uh, but they were brought up by these um, basically people working manually, going down on rope uh, ladders and bringing ores up, distributing them to villages where they would first hand crush the ores. This, this was all going after gold. They would then grind them with flour mills, the same people set up, that set up a distribution network in, in late 2009 from the, from the veins to the villages. Uh, they would uh, repurpose, distribute bags of, of ore in, in USAID flour, uh, repurposed USAID flour bags, uh, distribute them, people would buy them, they would hand crush them, then they would grind them. Uh, the same people that set up the distribution network actually then purchased flour mills for each of the villages. You can see the dust. They would then sluice and mix with mercury, uh, with mercury for amalgamation. Usually for artisanal mining, mercury amalgamation is the key thing that's causing the health issues. But in this case, uh, lead poisoning started showing up within six months in the, and kids and over 700 kids died and many thousands of more were probably uh, exhibiting signs of extreme lead poisoning. And you can see that little dot down that the person is pointing to in the palm of this, this uh, child uh, basically is all they get out of a big bag of war, but that's enough to be economically worthwhile for the families to do this. And basically geology is an underlying contributor to the problem. Um, this is the original um, quartz rich veins that had on enough gold, they weren't, I call them ores with quotes because they weren't really very high grade, but there was enough to process them. Significantly though, these were lead rich, primary lead sulfide. The natural weathering of the gold prior to the mining basically transformed lead sulfide, which is relatively not bioaccessible in the stomach acids into lead carbonate, which is highly bioaccessible. So it was the combination of the artisanal mining network and the flour grinding that actually um, combined with the geology, uh, combined to cause the problem. And so basically what we, we did was characterize and, and our, we think our results aided in cleanup. Basically these are scanning electron images on the left. Anything red is a lead rich particle. 
Um, and the scale bar is 250 microns, so anything less than that is basically ingestible by hand-to-mouth transmission. And actually, the, the, the flour mills that they were used for grinding, uh, the, the ores were then, when they're not grinding the ores, they were used for grinding their grains, and we could actually find lead in the, in the fibers that were being used to grind the grain. So again, this is a case where there's a, um, a geologic component, and it's the earth scientists working with the health scientists. Uh, we did bioaccessibility tests. I, I'll, I, I think I'm running out of time, so I won't talk about that. Uh, we could actually calculate uptake in the different areas per day and basically under very dirty conditions. Um, children, pregnant women, and adults were exceeding the provisional to total tolerable lead uptake level. So I'll, I think these slides will be available. I'll let folks take a look at them. And we have a paper in environmental health perspectives that summarize it. And then one last thing. Uh, an emerging contaminant, possibly, uh, is avian influenza virus. What happens when, anim when birds, which pick it up from interactions with uh, poultry in China, fly over and come and come in contact with poultry farms here, and they catch it, uh, and they have to dispose of large numbers of fowl? Um, what happens, and also the, the waste ponds, what happens? And so at the re request of the Wisconsin State Veterinarian, um, USGS folks started working on detecting avian influenza virus in groundwater. And so I think this is kind of a new spin on contaminants. What's the, pers uh, the occurrence and persistence? And if it's there, does it pose a, a, a health hazard? Is it, is it um, transmissible and, uh, and pathogenic? So with that, uh, basically, I'll with that whirlwind, uh, I want to talk, just call attention to our GeoHealth newsletter from the USGS Environmental Health Mission area that talks about a lot of our work, tr more traditional work, looking at contaminants in the subsurface, effects on biology uh, of contaminants and, and pathogens, and I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you. That was a very wide-ranging talk covering a lot of different topics. Uh, we do have time for a few questions if anybody needs any further explanation of any of the points that were made. Okay, hearing none. Great. Uh, thank you. Don't run away, Jeff, because we will have a broader discussion of this later. Oh, shucks, I can't. <laughs> and our next speaker is Prabhakar Clement. He's a professor in the Department of Civil Construction and Environmental Engineering at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. He's going to give us a presentation titled, Challenges in Predicting the Fate and Exposure Pathways of Environmental Contaminants. And this is looking at a lot of um, modeling type efforts. So uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. All right. Thank you, and, and thank you for giving me an opportunity. And you will quickly realize this is kind of an unlikely title for a guy who made money out of building a modeling career. Okay, so, uh, so to kind of set the talk up, um, I'm going to uh, open up with a kind of a philosophical quote. Am I okay with Mike? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm used to yelling at the big classroom, so. Uh, um, so I was kind of reading uh, different literature and came across this beautiful quote by uh, Herbert Timon, uh, who won Nobel Prize for this. He said, uh, he introduced this concept of bounded rationality. Basically, he challenges rationality and says, uh, rationality has its own limits, okay? And, and he says, what we should be looking for is satisfying solution, not the, the rational solution. And if you look at the dictionary, satisfies means examining alternatives and finding a best possible solution. So I'm going to leave this and we'll come back to it in the very last slide, okay? Um, so what I'm going to talk about it is actually a, a study funded by this board. This was eight years back, uh, a fairly controversial study and Susan was there. So, uh, and it was two years of hard work. I just want to summarize this and kind of leave some impressions on what we can learn from it actually. Sort of a post audit, if you will, okay? Uh, so before I get into the details, I should first acknowledge people who actually did the job. I was part of this panel, uh, but David Sivitz, fantastic, fantastic epidemiologist. He led that. It was, a, it was an honor to work for him. We, I really enjoyed it. 
so if you find any brilliant ideas in this presentation, it came from people other than me, okay? But if you find anything wrong, it's probably mine. However, I would never admit mistake because I'm a professor, right? Because I have a health problem, which is called LBD, which is called listening deficit disorder, which my wife identified 30 years back. I have two girls and they've been working on it and actually it's getting worse apparently. So I'll leave it there, okay? So let me start with the good news, which is, hey, here's a study you all funded. What did we get out of it? We actually got a bill. So this is beautiful because I get to see a study going all the way to the Senate bill, uh, which was actually signed by Obama and eventually got funded. Okay, so now look, look at the, if you look at the NAS charge based on Lincoln's uh, mandate, it's to provide independent advice to the nation to solve complex problems and inform public of policy decisions. And in some way, I kind of feel nice that we, we were able to contribute that. Now, so that's the good news. That's the beautiful, nice smelling sausage, right? So my purpose of my talk is to kind of open the sausage and show the sausage making process and what went on and what can we sort of learn from it, okay? So let me give a, a quick background on what was the problem. Uh, problem was a classic, uh, so we had a nice talk on natural contaminants. So this is an anthrop, this is a human made contaminant, basically which is PCE, right? Uh, so this was a problem at Camp Lejeune. Camp Lejeune Marine Base is a large base. It's 250 square foot. Uh, and there are many, many contaminated sites there. The problem was there was disposal of PC and PC. And, and basically that happened here, right at the downstream, there were drinking water wells, okay? Why would they do that? I don't know that, okay? That happens all the time. It's like one of those things. Uh, so you can see the plume was directly hitting those drinking water wells, so people are, actually exposed, there is no question about it. And there were a lot of health issues, including male breast cancer, which is a very rare event. And the, overall, the story is very similar to the classic PCE stories like civil action, which is a very classic urban story, right? So that's the problem. So the, there, were, there was a contamination, it happened. When did it happen? It happened way back, right? In the, in the 60s and, in 50s and 60s, okay? So moving on, this was our charge. Uh, review the scientific evidence on the association between the health effects and contaminated water, which is basically established causation, right? The second one is a lot more interesting. This is the first time uh, we were sitting in a similar room and, and this is one star general walks in, okay, with this big entourage and he looks at this little scientist and actually tells us, hey, tell us what happened. So that's actually very interesting to see how much the public trusts us and predict the past, what happened in the past and then tell us how to compensate, which means tell us how to provide, give us a solution. So this was the charge, okay? Now, what they did was, this was also the charge given to the, the, the team of experts. This was about eight years back. And they said, in order to predict the past, we got to depend on models, right? So I went to the project website and this is what they said. Uh, a water modeling is a scientific method that will help estimate the past that no longer exists today. Because remember, it happened in the 50s, and here we are in the, in the 2010. And water modeling method will help scientists fill the missing data. The models will tell us the past, which means the proposal basically said, here's a crystal ball, and you would go and ask the ball and say, hey, what happened? And it will tell you what happened. This is fantastic use of science, okay? So, so that was the proposal. So what happened? Well, fast forward 80 years, uh, the project was completed and one of the project director actually went to Congress, sought under oath and testified uh, in April 2007. He said, effective today, the former Camp Lejeune Marines and their families can find estimated exposure levels of PC, TC and degradation products calculated through modeling by visiting the website. So they actually went through a, a, a detailed modeling study, found the concentrations, and put that on the web so people can see it. So how was this information received? Extremely well. Health scientists, I've worked with a bunch of epidemiologists and toxicologists. By the way, that's the first time I realized epidemiologists and toxicologists do not get along with each other. So it's very, we had some very, very interesting. To me, an engineer, just to listen to that was a fantastic experience. So, um, but they both loved us. They said, the engineers have developed such an excellent model we can now use the model to predict exposure concentrations and proceed with risk assessment. Uh, what about the resident? They said, oh, we now know that the, we drank poisoned water. 
fantastic. We got a great review. Now, I thought, okay, I'll let me go to the website and pretend as if I am the Camp Lejeune resident. What would I get out of this? Well, I was born in 63, so I could actually get, if I were in Camp Lejeune, I could say, hey, I was exposed to 58.81 microgram per liter of PCE. So accurate, right? Uh, and then you can see when I was a teenager, I was a little bit cranky. I can even say that it's because it's PC is slightly higher, okay? So we can get some exact numbers. And, and then they also brought a beautiful summary slide, which shows, here's the model prediction. Uh, the exposure started in 55, and it went up, went above the MCO, very nice curve. They did Monte Carlo simulations, very good error bound. Now, when they catch this, look where's the data. Nothing much. The model does a beautiful job if there is no data, by the way, okay? When there's data, Mm, not, not really, okay? The primarily because there's nothing too wrong about modeling because this is 80s, PCE was not regulated. There was no technology to measure PCE, right? So, but overall it looked very nice, right? So what they did was they went ahead and said, okay, so here's the proposal to the Navy. Uh, we are almost done, uh, but wait a minute, we need a few more health studies uh, to finish up a few things and we could not predict some of the degradation products. For example, a PCE degrades to produce vinyl, which is a lot more riskier. So we need a little more reactive transport modeling, a little more complex model. If we can do that, we can exactly tell you what happened and, and the problem is solved. Science can solve the problem, which is all great news. And this is where we came in as, as, a, as a committee to look at, hey, what should we do? What should we advise Navy to do, right? So while we are doing this as a group, one day I was just sitting on my couch and started, had this philosophical question. Are we really that smart to accurately predict the past exposure scenarios using these complex groundwater models, which includes my own work? I mean, I built some of these models myself. So I said, well, should I be really happy or should I be sad? I was kind of confused. Now, at the same time, this was 2010, I opened one of our top journals, which is called Water Resources Research. That's the top journal. And I found this beautiful paper where they actually modeled a transport in a 40 centimeter column filled up glass beads, okay? And they filled a fine glass bead and coarse glass bead. So here's the picture. I actually repeated that since my lab. So you have a coarse glass bead, fine glass bead, same porosity, and they would send a, a pulse of salt from here and measure it, and then they flip it, send it from here and measure it, and then got the breakthrough curve. The basic model for that is we call a convection diffusion equation. It's very simple. Convection is a transport term, diffusion is a diffusive term, and then it doesn't matter how you flip, if your porosity is constant, it should give the same result. So, and it was actually done by Brian Berkowitz, who is the editor of the journal. So here's the top scientist doing the top work, publishing in the top journal, right? So here's our data they got. Uh, so this is, Obama was running for election, so yes, we can. It's, it's, so I was kind of excited at that time. So here, here is, you see a, a, a beautiful breakthrough curve. White is F to C and black is C to F. Beautiful. So we find, ah, oh, yes, we can. We are great. We know what, what to do. Except one of his graduate students said, let's repeat the experiment at the different velocities. And then everything falls apart. They can't predict, actually. The model fails. Okay, now think about it. Here's the top scientist trying to model a 40 centimeter column filled with glass beads, and he can't predict it. Okay, but I go to the National Academy, here I have a scientist who are telling me what was the PC concentration? 120.57 microgram per liter, perfect. Okay, is there a problem? So what, what can we do about it? Well, my conclusion was the basic convection diffusion equation, I now call it as a conviction confusion equation, Okay, so the velocity is like a conviction. Somebody will say, that's the velocity, you get it. And then D is confusion term, we'll just throw it in and forget about it, essentially, right? So look at the reality. A PC contamination has got a spill, it's, it, 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 it dissolves, it, the solution, and then the complex geology. We don't even know how much PC disposed because nobody is going to keep track of how much PC you disposed, assuming, hey, there will be a modeler who needs this data. So let me record it. No. So we don't know the source, right? So under this condition, what the proposal was, what should we do? 
what's the purpose of more health studies and advanced modeling efforts in resolving a complex policy problem like this? Well, we said, let's go back and look at our chart. What was our chart? Well, review available data and see whether there is causation and what should be, what would the, what would we do in terms of additional research and how can we compensate the residents? So our, our report, which was a 300 page report, had an executive summary which said, sorry guys, science cannot establish causation in a timely manner. Of course we defended it, why, okay? And then we said, stop research, okay? Develop a policy solution based on what you have, which we know there were contaminants, you know they were exposed, come up with a policy solution, okay? Now you can see, I remember this doing in Camp Lejeune, the residents were totally unhappy. They said, well, these guys were paid by the industry. And of course, my colleagues who got funding from this project, they were unhappy. Uh, big schools, they, they, they lost money, right? Politicians were unhappy. Navy was not happy. So I remember meeting David after, the, after this public hearing and he said, Prabhakar, you know what? If everybody is unhappy, we probably did something useful. So let's leave it like that, okay, that's all. So now, fast forward, several years later, there was a policy solution. So there was an act signed by President Obama in August 2012, and then it was actually funded just before President Obama left his office. And the funds basically decided to supplement the eligible veterans who were exposed 30 days cumulative. How did they come up with a 30 day? It's a sausage, actually. It's a policy solution. There were, the, the actual modeling results were used and then they eventually come up with some sort of a policy solution. And that is the best we can do in a time constrained manner, okay? So the question is, what can we learn from this experience? Well, I believe rational scientific solution to environmental problem, because tons of data. Therefore, a true scientifically defendable solution is literally a mythical solution, it doesn't really exist. So what we need is a bounded rational solution. So what next? Well, let's go back and look at Herbert Simon's quote. He, when he introduced the concept of bounded rationality, he said, human decision-making process is always limited by available knowledge and our mind's ability to process the information even if it is available. So what we should do is, we should always ask the question, how much complexity is needed to derive a satisfying solution or a bounded rational solution rather than a truly rational solution? Now, how do you go about it? Well, here is my first attempt. Uh, look at a science or a modeling. So here's a, a plot of, based on my experience, the money we invest in modeling, whereas the benefit we get, okay? Now, if there is a spill here, you came to me, I can tell you at least the spill will go this way or this way. I added in value to you, okay? Then I will charge, put a bell and tell you how fast it goes and say, hey, don't worry about for four years. I can tell you, it'll take about four years. You don't have to panic now, okay? I added value. I, I'm doing some modeling, some analysis, but there comes a point, you, can, you start throwing money, it platters up. And then comes a later point, you throw more money, you confuse the problem. You started losing value, okay? Now, where is this point? I don't know. I really don't know. But at the minimum, we should have in our mind this curve, essentially, this information curve, okay? And what I also suggest, so with that, here are my specific recommendations. I was actually with Star Wars Papadopoulos company yesterday, gave the version of this presentation. And he said a consulting company, he's a National Academy member, can look at some other old data and perhaps generate these curves, which will be a, a good information for people to have. So perhaps review past assessments and develop a series of cost-benefit curves that can be used to build a bounded rationality framework. That's, that's one option. And second one is establish an expert panel to review worthiness of large groundwater assessment projects. The beauty of our panel was we reviewed something before it started, so we can actually make some input into it. A completely impartial panel, academy can do it, somebody can, or, or AGU, National Groundwater Association can do it. How, I don't know. But that's, that's a worthy step. The last but not the least, I'm not, I'm not sure Susan would like this, it'll be nice to go back to Camp Lejeune 
and do a post audit. We never do this, actually. We do a study, forget about it. We do a study, forget about it. Here's an opportunity for the, the National Academy to go back and say, hey, here's the study. We went through it. What can we learn about it? And I believe there is ton to learn from that. So with that, I got to talk about football, because otherwise they'll fire me. So, so, <laughs> so thank you for your time. <laughs> Thank you very much for an interesting presentation. Do we have any clarifying questions that we'd like to bring up at this time? Yes. Oh, so I was I was um, uh, challenged a bit to understand the precision that was used in the numbers that you said about modeling, and and you know I. Is that we as we think about it, um, you you can get you know as many uh, decimal points as you can your model can derive. So you have to truncate that at some point. I'm wondering is was there discussion about kind of doing some probabilistic modeling or something like that or distribution of modeling? You know, figuring that out kind of with different parameters. So you do a bit of sensitivity analysis instead of kind of that point estimate of precision. We do that all the time, and they actually went back and did it later on, do a sensitivity analysis. But what is still missing is, remember, if I have a ruler to measure this, I would say this is like, I don't know, five, six, eight point two centimeter, right? I would never say this is eight point two, four, five, six, seven, eight centimeter. But in modeling, we, we have different types of models. Analytical model, simple numerical models, complicated models, that's like vernier caliper to a ruler to eyeballing. We have never had a serious discussion on accuracy and precision of models per se. We, we do still do Monte Carlo, some probabilistic analysis, but we never really associate a precision to the modeling complexity. That would be a, another interesting thing to think about. Yeah, and just to follow, then it's also the precision in support of the decision that you need, right? So that's, that's the other way that, of thinking about how much precision for, for the decision. Point, yeah. Fantastic point, yeah. And how do you do it? I don't know, but it, it's worth thinking about. Um, the settlement was $3 billion? Two, I think. Right? $2 billion. Yeah. Well, that's enough digits. Um, and <laughs> how much did all the study cost? All of it? I, 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 well, I, I, roughly. $100 million? No, Susan might. No, I, oh, I, I have not no that. idea. Yeah. Well, roughly. No, my point, I would say it's about $100 million. Okay. Yeah. My point is you could spend another $100 million, which is what? 5% of $2 billion. Might that not have moved the $2 billion one way or another? Is it the time constraint that you were after, or is it the money constraint? Time constraint. Oh, think about different. it. Think about it. These people are already sick. OK. And so, they might be dead and gone. Next question. Could you have implemented a policy decision which looked also at an interim policy solution and then some more studying to get it, to get it, more, to get it smarter, if you like, to bound the rationality further out? That's, that's, yeah, you could probably do a phased approach, but, the, but still, I think the, the thing was when we reviewed this thing, the question should be always tied to the policy solution, right, rather than science. So, but we, at some stages, the policy and the science kind of overlaps. So when, I, when we saw some of the proposals, we said, take it to NSF. It's a great problem, actually. But it's not a problem to, to resolve this policy solution. So how do you differentiate that? That's a challenge. But that you, you got a great point. We could do a phased approach. Good. We'll have time for further discussion on this. So Steve, did you have a clarifying question? OK. <laughs> I was struck by your notion that you said that there that nobody's thinking about precision accuracy and sensitivity. Uh, I mean, that's just in the no, world no. of modeling that I deal with, which I'm not a modeler. Uh, that's we've been doing that for decades, and oh. and we it wouldn't ever a number like that would never ever. I mean, it would have gotten trashed early. Uh, and so I, I'm just a little struck. I don't know no. if this is a bit cross disciplines or. No, no, the, the, this, as I said, this was a, a, a one, the minute they did the first set of modeling, they put this website and then they were trash and they went back and did Monte Carlo analysis. They did put error browns. Uh, so there are methods to evaluate, but what is not there is a systematic way to associate model complexity with precision. That's. There are people working on uh, that in other. 
Okay, I see some good points for discussion with our panel after our next presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Clement. He appreciated that. So our third and final speaker is going to, I think, kind of follow very nicely from this presentation. This is Alex Wardle. He's an environmental geologist with the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. The title of this presentation is Overcoming Barriers to Developing Risk-Based Cleanup Levels understanding where the mass of contaminant is and how the mass of contaminant moves. So I think that follows well from what we were just hearing. Oh. So it means the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> or we'll find I, out I, from I Dr. Waddle. So so can can Sorry, everybody I'm, hear me okay? Excellent. So I'm a geologist with the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality, and I work primarily on petroleum spills. So we've basically been spending the last 30 years trying to get to that bounded, rational solution that um, Dr. Clement has been was talking about. And what I'll try and do in this talk is kind of go through a little bit of the of our history as an agency um, in the petroleum program, and what we've kind of learned and what we learnt we need to know better that will get us to better um, bounded solutions. Let me see if I can work this. So this is going to be briefly what I'm going to talk about. Um, you know, what, what can we achieve in our petroleum spills? When we don't achieve them, what are the reasons for not achieving them? What are examples of better ways in which we can characterize a subsurface in order to be able to come up with, with better solutions? Um, what are the barriers to adopting those new characterization technologies? And I'll end by giving a pitch for the ITRC Advanced Site Characterization Tools Team, which I'm the joint lead of, that just got started in January, and we're trying to overcome some of those barriers. So the prologue, this is Bolston in Arlington. And back in 1944, the USGS was brought in because three properties had um, gasoline in their drinking water wells and explosive vapors in, in their basements. And the USGS went in, they drilled eight boreholes and recovered thousands of gallons of product from these, um, from these um, monitoring wells, recovery wells. And their solution at the end was, well, let's get rid of the water wells and seal the basement. And fundamentally, that's kind of what we still do now. So your grandfather would recognize a lot of what we do in petroleum remediation now. So our general objective in Virginia is the key is we want to prevent harm to human health and the environment from petroleum releases. And the key to that is we use a, take a risk-based approach. We look at the actual receptors that we know have affected, or we have a reasonable um, likelihood to believe are going to be affected. So we want to know where the source is. We want to know how things could move from the source and how they could get to that receptor and work out whether those are complete or likely to be complete. If they're not, for us, it's probably not a problem. And then we're required to remove pre-phase LNAP or from as a regulatory standpoint as best as practicable. And that's an evolving field for us. And is that a protective process? Well, our regu looking at just drinking water wells, back in when we started in the um, mid 80s in our program, we had many drinking water wells reported as impacted from gasoline releases. And we have, in Northern Virginia at least, we have had no reports of impacted drinking water wells from gasoline regulated facility releases for almost 10 years. Um, for residential heating oil tanks, which are often right next to people's drinking water wells, that's a different picture, but we don't regulate those, but we do clean them up. So what is the, what is, when we, to have a release and we go out and we ask people to do a site characterization, are they effective? Um, one of the ways we could look at that, and I looked at it, was back in the mid-90s, we went through a process of closing a lot of cases that had been reported to us because there were a lot of tanks being taken out of service and we had a huge caseload. And for various policy reasons, a decision was made to try and cut to the quick. So a lot of investigations were done, and some of them maybe weren't as detailed as a geologist would ideally like, and some of them were. Um, and then over time, people have gone back and they've done property transactions and they've investigated them, and we can compare what 
the conditions were when we closed the site to what they are now. So if you look at the concentration at the time of close and before, that ratio, if it's high, indicates that contamination is increasing. If it's low, below one, it's reducing, which is what we would like if we had identified contamination and worked out what, um, whether they were problem sites or not. And what did we find? Summarizing it, if no significant site characterization had done, just a sort of conventional drill three wells, take three soil samples, take three water, water samples, we found going back to those sites in the past, for depending on the contaminant, you know, maybe half of them were worse when we came back to them than they were when we closed them. If we did a little bit more, if the characterization was more in depth, that ratio went down. And if we knew where the source was and the source had been removed and we did a decent characterization, we had pretty good results. When we go to a site and we decide to clean them up, you know, what, what can we actually practically achieve with cleanup? This is based on about 300, and 300 odd corrective actions done in the northern region of Virginia over the last 20 years. And you can see this above, this side of this green line is basically, it got worse after we did the cleanup. From here to here is one order of magnitude reduction. So we're pretty good at achieving one and two orders of magnitude reduction. But any more than that is gets kind of tricky for most of our sites. And you know, this is the NCL for benzene, five micrograms per liter. So we're about 20% of our cases groundwater can achieve, could achieve the NCL. Now, go back to the slide I showed earlier about affected drinking water wells. Oh, this level of remediation was sufficient to be protective of those drinking water wells. And so it is effective, it is a, a rational solution, but it's not necessarily achieving what people think we might be needing to achieve. So why is this? One of the issues is we are, we've been historically we're focused on just the regulated contaminant, the contaminant that has an MCL. Um, if you might, might be expanded to the priority pollutant list that EPA provides, but a lot of times, particularly in our program, we're just, you know, historically, when we, when we first started, we were, uh, back in the 70s, could we see oil? And that was the indicator. Then we were doing just measures of uh, TPH. So, you know, 1,000 micrograms per liter plus of contaminant, not really looking at anything lower than that. And then we moved through, we looked at the BTEX compounds, and now we're starting to we've looked at the additives in the 2000s, and now we're starting to look about look at more breakdown products. And historically, when you do these investigations, you take a couple of samples, they're analyzed to a very high level of quality control and precision in the lab, but there's only a few, and so those results have to be averaged across the site. They're extrapolated between different media. You look at the soil results to see whether you might have an effect on groundwater. You look at groundwater to see if you might have an effect on vapor concentrations in the in the soil that might affect people's indoor air quality. And you extrapolate, use simplistic models to say, well, if I have it here, will it affect this drinking water well, this person on a property down there? So there's a lot of things, a lot of the functions that go into that process. And even if we do look at that MCL, is that MCL really meaningful in terms of overarching um, health protection? We've, our, programmatic level that we want to achieve in a drinking water well for benzene is 0.6. The 5 MCL, and you guys probably know this better than I do, is essentially a, a pragmatic solution that came, that came up for that contaminant in the 1980s. Um, if you look at air, the parts per billion are again significantly less than the MCL. So the MCL doesn't in and of itself mean it's protective. So maybe it's not, it shouldn't be used as just the arbitrary um, threshold that we want to get to clean up. We want to use to demonstrate cleanup. So what do we miss? We typically we can't investigate the source. We may not know exactly where the source is. If the facility is still operational, we can't get underneath the tanks. If there's been a development over it, we can't drill through the buildings. Those few samples are not representative. Um, 
we know there's a whole range of contaminants that we're not looking at that are part of the petroleum mix. And we can't extrapolate between media. And the pathways can't be simply or easily modeled, again, as Dr. Clement kind of indicated to us. So this is an example of, you can't use one media to look at another. This was a series of about 40 in investment investigations that came to us. And you can see there's really no link between the groundwater concentrations and the soil concentrations. And again, this is the typical divestment investigation is three or four samples of soil, three or four samples of groundwater. If historically we've always looked at you know, a 20, 30 foot long well in the groundwater is maybe 10, 15 foot intervals that we're sampling. When we've broken that down into individual one to two foot sample intervals, you can see that this is an average of lots of very different things happening through the groundwater column. And this again is for petroleum contaminants, which historically have been considered to be you know, stuff that floats near the surface. But you know, it, once it gets into the water column, it moves with the, um, moves with the water molecule. Uh, petroleum is a mix. Say VTEX, we didn't look at it before the 1980s. The additives, we didn't look up until before the 2000s. Many of the constituents of petroleum and other complex pollutant um, mixes don't have MCLs. Many don't ha necessarily have a health-based risk, but they smell bad if they're in your water or if they're in air is getting into your basement. That's still an issue. You know, that's, we can't ignore that as, a, as, a, as an agency, but what do we use as a way to, um, to regulate that? So it's just a simple example of these two big heating oil USTs been in place since the 1950s, discovered there was a spill when they were closed, Oops. did a conventional borehole, put in a well, found that there was product here and some soil contaminant concentrations. We asked them to go back and do something a little bit more sophisticated, laser-induced fluorescence, where they do multiple probes and they get a continuous fluorescent image of the product, and this is what the plume Actually, more likely looks like in the ground. You've got perched horizons migrating down through sand gravel um, channel units, getting to the deeper groundwater next to the river, and being able to move and create that floating product. So you can see from the conventional investigation, if you did a remediation here, you might have just treated down here and not known what was going on up here. And this eventually would make would continue to recharge this product down here, and you'd be there in perpetuity, never getting below your one or two orders of magnitude of cleanup. This is an example of complex geological pathways. One of these rare cases we know exactly when the spill occurred, we know exactly where it is, and yet it created some complexity for us. We, the um, responsible party got to it within a couple of days, excavated 2,000 tons of soil, pretty much looked like it was clean. So based on the simple model of what's going on, we knew there was a well um, a few hundred feet away. Based on simple permeability calculations and hydraulic gradients, that well wouldn't be affected for five to 40 years. So pretty simple issue, shouldn't be a problem. But three months later, that drinking water well was contaminated. So something more complicated is clearly going on. So we looked at the complexity of the um, geology using surface geophysics to look for preferential pathways in the subsurface, downhole geophysics to work out where the fractures are, which fractures are providing water, which fractures aren't. Still, after 10 years, still finding significant recalcitrant contamination, went back and did membrane interface probe studies and discovered that even though they'd done remediation of the surface groundwater, contamination had migrated at depth and was still there. So it was still recharging um, the groundwater with those contaminants and was not degrading necessarily as quickly as we needed to see to protect those drinking water wells. So, but of that simple picture, we have a much greater level of complexity. 
And all of these things need to be understood in order to be able to even make a simplistic analysis of what's happening in the subsurface and come to some predictions as to what's going to happen when, let alone go back in time like Dr. Clement did to find to work out, okay, how is that going to move? How is that going to disperse? How is that going to degrade? So looking at this another way, you know, we as a program and the most environmental programs have always been very focused on what is the concentration of the contaminant in my particular unit? So this is an example of a site. These are orders of magnitude, but they're pretty close in the three different units um, in the geology. When you look at where is the contaminant actually being stored, in this weathered unit, there's a lot more porosity. It can hold a lot more contaminant. In the transition zone, where it goes from the weathered unit to the bedrock, there's pretty much good storage and virtually none in the bedrock, which is just the space and the fractures. But what's, where is it moving? Very low, slow movement in the, in the storage in the saprolite, but really fast storage in the transition zone. So if you're going to do an effective remediation, you, can't, you need to do something different here, because you want to recover this, from here where it's moving. So you might be able to still rapidly treat this, but this is going to be slow and going to be a, is going to be a different technology. So knowing this, can we get to that, that rational um, objective? So this is an example of developing some cleanup levels that aren't MCLs, but are hopefully protective. So this development occurred back in the 90s, early 90s. The developer provided two supply wells for the development. And as soon as they started um, developing them to see whether they were suitable, they found they had MTBE contamination in them. And this was in the sort of late 90s, 2000s. And we had three old gas stations here where we had cases and they were, they were closed because we didn't see any problem. The, the, the town was on public water, um, no real issues, no real levels of contamination. But once they put these wells in, we went, oh, there could be a problem here. So they went out, they ended the geophysics to find preferential pathways. Broadly speaking, some fractures oriented in that direction, but dipping in that direction. And we realized that probably we had a problem, but how to deal with it. So going in over the years, mediations happened. We wanted to bring this to a close. We had spent about $4 million on the cleanup of the various properties and run, the agency was running out of money from our funds. Um, so we did a little bit more complicated investigation, did put these multi-level samples in, worked out where things were moving and decided to work some mass flux calculations to work out, okay, how, what's actually going to happen when we turn these wells on? So by understanding what those levels were, the relative transmissivity and concentrations, what is the mass in those units, work out what are the pumping rates of the well. If we could get an average of 100 micrograms per liter on the, in the area of the releases, once we pump those wells, they should get down to an acceptable level. And that's pretty much what happened. Those wells, when they, before they were pumping, were in the 100 to 200 level. We were able to, based on those predictions, stop the remediation here. And then when the pumping started, rapidly fell down until now they're in the two, two to four micrograms per liter level, which is more than acceptable. The town required the developer to put in a treatment system that was capable of achieving this level of cleanup. So we are pretty comfortable those wells are protected. So in order to make good decisions, we need to understand that heterogeneity in the soil and the rock controls what, what's going on. We need to understand that distribution is going to be complex and requires a lot of more detailed, but not necessarily precise characterization. Understand how, if we understand those, we can understand how the contaminant moves, we can understand how it moves in the soil column, how it moves in the water. It is complicated, but it's geology, so we know how that works. So these are the sort of new and I use new in inverted commas because many of these tools have been around for a long time but with 
the available computing power we have now and the ability to resolve the information that comes from these tools in a much more precise way, we can use these, we can use them on site, we can get decisions very quickly, we can communicate them to effective parties, to stakeholders in a very direct way, in a very graphic way that allows people to understand what's going on. Um, there are some other newer things, directional drilling, again, the oil industry has been doing that for a long time, but as environmental scientists, we don't use that. And with the drones, now I'm quite excited that remote sensing is gonna give us the stuff that we used to have to have an airplane for, we're gonna be able to use at our site or large site level on a routine basis. So the barriers to use, you know, lack of understanding of these tools is one of the main barriers. People perceive them as being very expensive, they don't know what tool to use, and they're not readily available, and it's difficult to interpret what's going on. On a minor you know, regulatory acceptance, as regulators, certainly in Virginia, we don't have, we're not obliged to require any particular tool, but when we get to a decision point, we're probably always gonna come back to eventually we need to have a lab analysis that tells us, gives us a number. So in order to overcome these barriers, you know, we, the ITRC has formed this team of non advanced site characterization tools, and ITRC is, if you're not familiar with it, is a group led by the states. We bring together federal ag agencies, um, private companies, and state workers to work out what the current um, environmental science is and how to get that into, into our hands as state project managers. So it's sort of the work you do, we try and use that to come up with pragmatic ways of getting us to be able to apply the great stuff that you guys create for us. So that's our mission. And you know, the key thing is when you come into the ITRC, it's a whole group of different professionals from different backgrounds. But once they're in that, in that group and they are producing that guidance, that's what their objective is. So the other people working on overcoming these barriers, EPA is doing a lot of enhanced site characterization training. So the ESTCP has got some great guidance and webinars out. Um, and ITRC has been working on various aspects of this for a while and you guys here at the National Academy have been doing some very good stuff. Okay, and I'm just gonna leave that for a little synopsis of, the, of our, our team that is working on this. So anybody who's interested in participating, please join us. Okay. Great, thank you very much. Um, uh, any clarifying questions from the board? I do have one question. Um, you were talking in, at the beginning and we kind of framed this whole thing as exposure pathways for human health and environmental risks. So you did mention in your talk that since I think it was 2004, you've not seen any groundwater intrusion into surface water, which is one area to get ecological risk. Are there any other ecological risks that you would consider from groundwater contamination? From a programmatic view, we're typically looking at surface water. I mean, we would also look at marshes and um, you know, any, any sort of part of the water environment. Um, I, I, I think, is that what you're, what you're getting at? Yeah, precisely, because you know, often as eco-talks, people get pulled into some groundwater discussions, and I am frequently scratching my head and saying, if you have no hyperreic flow into surface water, what is the question here? So I was wondering if you had had any experience with other types of ecological questions in that regard. Yeah, and yeah. typically, as a program, we, if we don't see it, if it's not a visible oil, then we're not necessarily being made aware of it. But we know, again, from the MCL perspective, there are many contaminants that the MCL may be one level, but the actual, for an environmental exposure, the level, acceptable level for our water programs will be at a lower mm -hmm. level. And we have to bear that in mind when we, when we get to the point of corrective action. Gina? Yes, you mentioned vapor intrusion uh, in your presentation. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, how you approach that issue, because um, I know that there is quite, a, as I understand it, quite a bit of controversy around the use of 
um, attenuation factors to predict vapor intrusion versus, um, I think it's the Johnson Ettinger model and, you know, uh, it, different um, sort of schools of thought about how to look at that issue and, and focus on uh, when to collect actual data um, on indoor air. Yes, and that, that could be a whole talk all of its own, <laughs> as, as I'm, I'm sure you, you know. The key things from the petroleum perspective, the reason why Johnson & Ettinger has gone out of favor is because we understand that petroleum degrades. Once there's oxygen in the soil column, petroleum in the vapor form degrades very rapidly. And we, we have the, the data to support that. Um, ITRC did a study a few years ago, um, put all that information together. EPA, I think, is taking it on board with their latest guidance for vapor intrusion. Um, and certainly when we've looked at it on a case-by-case -case basis, we can see that pattern. You know, typically, if you, once you get outside of the mass of contaminant, whether it's in the soil or the water column, and you, get, you can measure oxygen, we can't measure petroleum vapor. So that's kind of, from an investigation point of view, that's kind of been our threshold. It's like, let's, if we think there's a problem, let's do subsurface um, vapor sampling and air sampling, oxygen, carbon dioxide, see what that pattern is. If that shows it's broken, breaking down, broken down, we know we don't have a problem for the structure. If we find it's still there at the level of the structure, then we have that question, do we go into the structure to take a sample? And Unfortunately, the contaminants we're looking at are ubiquitous within the built environment. So once we go inside the house, we will find those petroleum contaminants. There's no question. And so then it's, well, is this from the subsurface or the, and there's things we can do in terms of looking at, unfortunately around here, you can look at radon to see, well, is there migration happening across that basement? So you can kind of see, well, does that pathway exist? And you can, you can create that um, relationship that allows you to make a rational decision as to, is this an effect? Um, thankfully, in our program, we're a very protective program. So if we think it's an issue, we're going to go in and we're going to provide the engineered solution to that property rather than spend a lot of money on characterizing it because the solution is a lot cheaper than the investigation. So again, to talk about that practical bounded solution, it's like, okay, let's just, let's just do it. There's no point in having an argument um, about the issue. So sorry, it is so it's a little bit more tricky because they don't degrade. Um, so does that answer the question? So I actually have another question, if I may. Um, okay. You mentioned preferential pathways, and it sounded like you were talking mostly about sort of natural fractures in the rock. Um, what about um, sort of man-made structures, sewer lines, utility lines, those kinds of things? Are those preferential pathways that, that you look at? I know that th those have been an issue. Again, I, I know a little bit more about the vapor intrusion area than I do about the issues you talked about, and I was just wondering how it applies. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, typically, the focus is on the geologic pathways because they're more difficult to characterize. But one of the critical parts of the characterization effort is where are the utilities in relation to where we know there's contamination? Because particularly for vapor, if you have a utility that runs over a, over a source of contamination, that's going to be a preferential pathway, particularly into a building. Um, if you have a water line that goes through the contamination, that breaks through the foundation, you know, that's clearly going to be an issue. So those are, yes, we, we, that's a key part of the process. A clarifying question. So one one clarifying question. I um, it, it, maybe it's a broader question as well. But you mentioned the fact that kind of uh, in, in the the city or one of the municipalities set a cleanup level, and then you guys were able to actually, with your knowledge of of migration through the subsurface, in understanding about the, the hydro hydrology. Um, come up, you know, with a solution that actually drove that that level much lower. So, is that is that? Do you find that? I guess it's a kind of question. Is that that a common act, act, uh, activity where you're able to kind of look more, where you get a better um, outcome with more investment of time, effort, and resource, and, and understanding the hydrology significantly, 
or do you find that, as you kind of indicated earlier, that if you know what the problem is and you can kind of figure out the the, the limited set of solutions you run in and you do that? Is there have you have you looked at that in terms of kind of investment and return on investment at all? Um, not systematically, but really it's a question of what are, what what are your solutions? Do you have a simple engineering solution that you can apply? So for the town that we were looking at here, you know, they they said, well, the simple solution is we make sure that whatever the whatever this is the highest number that was ever in those wells, so they they need to treat it. They need to be able to treat the water that comes out of those wells at that level. So that was that was they had a simple engineering solution for that. They were they were covered from a programmatic point of view. That really wasn't ideal for us because you know, maybe that treatment solution would fail. The town would run out of money to maintain it. You know, we wanted to be able to have longer term protectiveness, so we wanted to invest invest a little bit more time and effort to say, okay, let's get it to the point where even if that system doesn't exist that well, those wells will still be fit for purpose. And so that was the additional investment, which was relatively minor in, in the grand scheme of this particular process and the importance of the groundwater resource. So yeah, each one has its, has its balance. I guess I was, I was intrigued on that because it seemed like a, a little more science gives you a much better solution, right? And, and, uh, and so trying to kind of uh, conceptualize that in a way and communicate that I think could be very helpful. Yeah, and if you go back to, you think about the early plots I had of the effectiveness of the site characterization, the effectiveness of the remediation, you know, whilst they may have been broadly protective of what things are like, they weren't really necessarily improving the environment as much as we would like, but a relatively small investment in time and technology probably would get that, those numbers to a better place. <laughs> Tina, can you hold your question for the broader discussion? We'll get you first. <laughs> so if we could thank our speakers for some very interesting presentations. I really appreciate what they've done. And ask the three of them to take their spot at the table. And we can now open the discussion up to sort of broader thoughts and ideas. Although if you have specific questions, we can address those as well. And let's keep in mind that what we're trying to do is address the question, what are key challenges and advances for assessing the quality of the subsurface environment and managing risks? And from the point of view of this board and the academy, who are the players, who are the um, agencies and organizations that may uh, need to have more science to help them understand these questions about subsurface contamination and managing risks. So we'll open the discussion up to the board and then in about oh, 20, 25 minutes or so, we'll see if there are people that are still online that might like to um, join the discussion as well. So Gina, did you want to get us started? Um, sure, and this is, I, I guess, mostly um, for Dr. Wordle, but also for Dr. Clement. Um, in both of your presentations, you um, were looking at situations where there was sort of one prime, you know, one principal uh, source. Um, and in many urban or industrial areas, there are multiple sources, and you start sort of um, looking up gradient and finding contamination in that area and you may or may not have you know given the construct of these programs you may or may not have a responsible party um, and and so things can quickly get even more complicated and I was wondering if you have sort of ideas about how to to get at that issue there have been some proposals out there um, to to really look at these um, issues more on a um, sort of a groundwater aquifer basis or, you know, to, to really not try to chase down each individual plume. That would presumably require some changes in how we sort of think about um, cleanup programs. But I, I was wondering if you could sort of talk about how that works in, in your experience. So, for, 
from a just from you know, my little universe of the petroleum program in Virginia, you know, we are constrained by the laws and regulations to just do it site by site, and that's frustrating. So that's just for petroleum. And then when you add, as you say, in urban environments, it's not just petroleum. There's the dry cleaner. There's the old whatever the degreases that the car repair place used or the industrial activity. And some of these may have a program that looks at them and some of them don't. And in Virginia, we have the voluntary remediation program, but again, looks at each of those in isolation, but we don't. And I don't think there are many states that do have a sort of overarching, if you like, groundwater protection purview. You know, it's, to me, and again, this is purely a personal, on a personal basis, that seems a, a lack. Um, it's with the Safe Drinking Water Act, groundwater sources have certain source protection parameters that communities and localities follow to try and keep those protected. But if there's an issue and it falls to the, the water and water entity to, to deal with them because the source may not be identified. So they may be able to come to us as a regulator and say, can you find this? And we may be able to say yes, or we may say, no, not really. We don't have a program that can, has money to go and look at that. Um, so that from a policy legislation perspective, having some way of doing that would be certainly seem to be the next step in environmental protection that we need to go, particularly if you look at it from the broader aquifer perspective, it's like, well, we don't need to clean up every molecule of water in this aquifer. We just need to know that we're protecting where we're using the water in that aquifer, whether it's going to a drinking water well, it's going to a marsh, you know, if it's ecological or a, um, or a um, human health perspective. In, in my part of the country, perhaps the highest risk of subsurface contaminant, and I thought of this with the vapor intrusion story, is radon. And we, we worked hard to, to try to get a bill through the legislature to measure radon in schools. And it failed because it was opposed by the school superintendents because there's no money allocated to solve the problem. So they didn't want to measure it and know what the problem is. And, and I wonder if, if there's a lesson there in, in other areas um, and, and, or if even radon is a subsurface contaminant as we're thinking about it here. Well, certainly since uh, I talked about geologically sourced arsenic, geologically sourced radon is very clearly one that's been up on people's radar screens for a number of years. So it, it, it is yet another one. And, and the interesting because of the characteristics, it, it can have multiple exposure pathways as well. It can become volatilized and go into basements. Um, out in Colorado, where I spent most of my, my career, um, the Pikes Peak Basilisk, some of my colleagues looked there and, and you could actually, um, the biggest exposure pathway was when people would get their water from the wells and they would heat it up for their morning shower and then it would volatilize into the shower and that was a, a very big exposure pathway. And so that's, that I, I'm, I'm not, I don't, I don't think it's appropriate for me to weigh in from policy perspectives, but certainly from a communication standpoint, how can you, how can we effectively communicate? How can we understand, at least provide people the tools by which they can understand this? And, and how can we actually get the data that would allow them to understand is there an issue or is there not? So it's, that's not really a good answer to your question, but I certainly would lump right on in with the, with the, uh, uh, with the geologically sourced naturally uh, naturally occurring, but in some cases human enhanced exposures. Yeah, um, question for, for uh, Dr. Clement on the uh, Camp with Gene study, actually uh, a couple of interrelated questions. Um, it, it, it seems to me that a, a key piece of the equation in 
a situation like Camp Lejeune is uh, the degree of confidence that you have in the causal link between uh, cancers in this case and uh, exposure to the contaminants. And if the evidence is suggesting that there really is uh, a causal link. It, it may be that on the exposure characterization side, you can tolerate a higher degree of imprecision than in a case where the causal connection really is open to dispute. And so my question uh, is, is uh, what degree of confidence was there uh, about the causal link between contamination with PCE and TCE and the adverse health effects that uh, the community was reporting. So um, I got to qualify my answer because first of all, I'm not an epidemiologist. So, but having sat on different meetings uh, with, with the epidemiologists, the, the, the real bottleneck was tracking people, remember, in Camp Lejeune, these people come and serve for 30 days to 60 days, and then they leave. Okay, and then some cases, the babies were born there. They were little children, basically. They were born there. Uh, so there was no record to track them to find exactly when they were there. And then, so there were two pieces, right? The groundwater piece is different, and that's what I looked at it very carefully. And there was a piece of tracking people, essentially. The different registries have this information. They try to do that. Uh, and then linking exposure to that, how many days were there. And that was complicated. Number second was the lifestyle. So people leave and they have, they were young, 20, 21 to 25 years old. And now they are probably 50, 60 years old and they have certain disease. In between, we don't know what lifestyle they had. They could have, um, I don't know, smoked, they could have uh, drank and all kinds of this thing. And then there was Agent Orange, for example, was they could have been exposed to. In fact, um, David was involved in that panel too. Uh, so I remember they were talking about in the battlefield, what kind of exposure they had. How do you differentiate all this? So this whole idea of a linking exposure to specific population was a huge challenge. So, so in fact, one of the things they, studied, the, they suggested was do a follow-up study to go back to some registries to reconstruct some of these things uh, but the epidemiologists in the group looked at it and said, yeah, we could probably do that, but it, we are now getting into an academic exercise, probably. We're not going to solve this problem in a timely manner. That's a very important point, um, because these guys need solution now. So so we have this thing. It's a great academic exercise, but should we do that? So, so that was the kind of a bottleneck to linking people to exposure. And I remember talking to them um, at that time, like, I mean, it took, what, 30, 35 years to prove, show that smoking causes cancer. We know the exposure, we know the causation. I mean, still the, the tobacco industry fought. So these are complicated problems, obviously. And, and so when time is an issue, how do you deal with that? That's the challenge. Jeff, did you want to follow up? Yes, I, I, I want to reiterate that so um, our, our colleagues in the medical community um, have repeatedly said to me when I'm, when I work with them, correlation does not mean causality, and so that's actually a key place where the earth scientists, the geochemists, and the, and and folks can actually play a role in helping cement those links. So, so um, for and using the lead poisoning in Nigeria as one example, uh, we were actually able to show what the mineralogy was. Just because something's high lead doesn't mean it will actually be really highly bioaccessible. And the exposure pathway could could vary as well. So we allow we provide the tools that can help them understand how people are taking it up. Is it actually if they're taking it up, does that mean that it's actually getting absorbed? And and if it's getting absorbed, then we can, we actually have tools that we can use to help understand its distribution in the body. So it's again a key part of the transdisciplinary aspect of of the whole process that bringing all the different disciplines toolkits to bear to help understand is there is there actually causality from the correlation and, and providing that refined information and particularly in cases of complex exposures as well uh, the, one of the things we found in nigeria was that the people were not so they were also getting exposed to the mercury it was the lead that was manifested first 
but then they were also getting exposed to high arsenic, high antimony, and high manganese, and, and high crystalline silica. So there's all these complex things that they were getting exposed to. And what are the combined effects? What are the sequential effects? What will happen first and all that? So there's a lot of complexity that we really need to be working together to help understand. Thank you. Um, we're going to do Dom and then Bill and then George and then Les. Um, I was struck by the yep. groundwater uh, modeling uh, presentation, which which basically suggested that if you could figure out where the water was going, you could figure out where the contaminant was going. But of course, you've got reactive transport to worry about, and in particular, you've got sorption to the solid phase. You make a one order of magnitude mistake in the partition coefficient, you make a one order of magnitude mistake in the time that it takes to go from here to there. There are not a whole lot of models that can calculate sorption coefficients to one order of magnitude precision. Um, so how worried are you about that? A great question. So, um, so here's how I look at it. So, so I'm a model developer. So some of my code called RT3D, which is a reactive I made my life doing reactive transport. Um, the, the problem is, uh, it's, I can put all these nice parameters. I can use different isotherms. I can do rate limited sorption, all these things, right? And then we can do parameter uncertainty to create bounds and all that. The pro that's model uncertainty, right? But that is an epistemic uncertainty. When I built the model, I knew I put in something which I'm not 100% confident about. I mean, like, for example, I would go back and even challenge the basic Darcy's law. I mean, Darcy did a little column experiment and defined hydraulic conductivity. It's a macroscopic description of our head loss, essentially, right? So there are epistemic uncertainty. How do we include that? That's the challenge. That's where I think an expert panel would help. Somebody would, would sit together and say, hey, you know,